the number of specimens relevant for a Neanderthal evaluation has diminished considerably throughout the years, as a result of a continuous process known as de-Neanderthalization. This term refers to the process through which human fossils, originally labelled as Neanderthals, were subsequently re-evaluated and defined otherwise. The Neanderthaloids of North Africa and the Middle East, including Jebel Irhud, have been reclassified as distant relatives to Homo sapiens. As a result of this de-Neanderthalization process, Tabun, Amud, Kabara and other fossil remains are the only fossils from Israel still regarded as genuine Near Eastern Neanderthals. While earlier these fossils were classified as Neanderthals, they have since been de-Neanderthalized and classified as Eelry Homo sapiens to fit the prevailing narrative that Neanderthals were not intelligent enough to migrate to Africa and were replaced by more intelligent and adaptable African hominins. What these fossils tell us is that our species, Homo sapiens, is a hundred thousand years older than we thought. We are a third older than we realised. Examining the limits of the Neanderthal range is critical for determining these species' environmental tolerances, as well as investigating their ecological adaptability and behavioural flexibility. In a remote corner of Morocco, at a windswept site called Jebel Irhud, Archaeologists have unearthed fossils that challenged everything we thought we knew about the dawn of humanity. Far to the north, in the steep limestone ridges of southern France, the cave of Arago has yielded remains of a population long believed to be unrelated. Archaic, perhaps Neanderthal-bound, but resolutely European. But what if these two sites, separated today by the vast blue sweep of the Mediterranean, were once connected? What if their fossils whisper of a forgotten thread in human history, woven across a now-submerged land bridge through Malta and Italy, carrying with it not just genes but culture, language and memory? This link is proposed not simply on the basis of geography or coincidence, but on shared facial morphology, tool culture, and likely pathways of migration that opened during periods of lowered sea levels. At the heart of this connection is a powerful clue. The Musterian tool tradition, a cultural signature that bound together disparate populations. And central to the biological evidence is the distinction between robust male and gracile female fossil forms, which may offer critical insights into population relationships. Towards the close of the period of Musterian culture, men of the modern European type appeared suddenly in lands to the north of the Mediterranean, strong in tooth, robust in jaw, big-brained, and fully developed in type. Where did they come from? In which land were they evolved? We have only circumstantial evidence to guide us, but this evidence points to the Pleistocene temperate lands, stretching from the Levant in the east to Morocco in the west, lands which are now reduced to sandy wastes as the homeland of the first man. The fossils at Jebel Irhud, reanalyzed and redated in the landmark paper by Jean-Jacques Hublin and colleagues, are among the oldest controversially assigned to Homo sapiens. Thermoluminescence dating of heated flint artifacts from the same layers yielded an age of approximately 315,000 years, pushing back the timeline of our species by over 100,000 years compared to the then prevailing East African model. The site yielded at least five individuals, including adult and juvenile crania, a juvenile mandible, Irhud III, and most intriguingly, Irhud 10, a partial but nearly complete face. The morphology of Irhud 10 is key. It shows a flat mid-face, reduced prognathism, and delicate zygomatic bones, lacking the heavy projecting brow ridges seen in more archaic hominins. These facial proportions, as noted by Hublin, are remarkably modern, and among the earliest to exhibit this suite of features in the Homo lineage. Irhud 10's gracility stands out, in contrast to the more robust features of Irhud 1 and 2, which are thought to represent males, Irhud the 10th of May represent a female individual, based on its lighter bone structure, smaller nasal aperture, and overall compact facial anatomy. This distinction between robust and gracile forms within the same population mirrors patterns observed at European sites, including Arago and suggests both sexual dimorphism and population variation within an early Homo sapiens group. Arago Cave, or Grotte de l'Arago, near Tautavel in southern France, 
has produced a remarkable sequence of hominin fossils spanning 400,000 to 300,000 years ago. The most famous specimen is Arago 21, a partial cranium with robust brow ridges and thick bone typical of middle Pleistocene humans. Arago 7, a mandible, is similarly robust, massive in size, deeply rooted, and without the modern human chin. Yet despite their robust features, the Arago fossils are not entirely alien to the Homo sapiens line. The mandible of Arago 7, while lacking a mental protuberance, chin, shows relatively modern dental proportions and wear patterns. Furthermore, some of the more fragmentary fossils from Arago display gracile features that have often gone unnoticed in favour of the massive male specimens. The theory here is not that the Arago individuals were Homo sapiens as we define them today, but rather that they belonged to a related population, perhaps one that had diverged from or shared common ancestry with the Jebel Irhud population. This is not an outlandish idea. At 315,000 years old, Jebel Irhud is roughly contemporary with Arago 21 and predates most classic Neanderthals. In a world of porous population boundaries and regional variation, Jebel Irhud and Arago may have been part of a connected species complex, whether sapien-like or Neanderthal-like. One of the key aspects of this theory rests on sexual dimorphism. Robust male fossils like Irhud 1 or Arago 21 often dominate collections because of their size and preservation. But female fossils, especially facial bones like Irhud 10, provide a subtler signal. Across primate species, female skeletal morphology tends to be less divergent and more conserved across populations. That means gracile female faces may better reflect deep ancestral traits and population continuity than their more variable male counterparts. When Irhud 10 is compared to reconstructed female faces from Arago and other Middle Pleistocene sites in Europe, a pattern begins to emerge. Moderately tall faces, reduced brow ridges, smaller nasal apertures and less facial prognathism. These traits are transitional, but trending toward the modern human condition. They suggest not isolation, but convergence or better shared ancestry. The similarity in facial topography between Irhud 10 and some of the lesser-known Arago specimens supports the notion that these two populations may have exchanged genes, learned from the same traditions, or even descended from a common ancestral population during the Middle Pleistocene. Several studies inferred that the cave dwellers had been cannibals by the presence of burnt human bones. Such a supposition affords the most likely explanation of the conditions found. It is a remarkable fact that in two communities, separated so widely in time and in space, we should find strange and unsavory practices so similar in their manifestations. Where morphology can be ambiguous, stone tools can be eloquent. At both Jebel Irhud and Arago, the tool industries are dominated by Levalois technology, a method of flake production that involves preparing a stone core to detach a single controlled flake. This method requires abstract planning and is a hallmark of the Musterian cultural tradition. Though most famously associated with Neanderthals, the Musterian was widespread across Europe and North Africa for over 200,000 years. The tools at Jebel Irhud, described by Hublin et al. as Middle Stone Age, nevertheless conform to the technological and typological criteria of Musterian assemblages, side scrapers, Levalois flakes, and discoid cores. The presence of nearly identical toolkits at Jebel Irhud and Arago is no coincidence. This cultural parallel suggests shared knowledge systems or population contact, and such contact would have been facilitated by something now invisible to us, land bridges revealed during glacial sea level lows. At times during the Pleistocene, especially around 300,000 years ago, Sea levels fell by over 100 metres, exposing vast swaths of land. A corridor would have opened from Tunisia to Sicily, across Malta, and into southern Italy. These land bridges formed a stepping stone chain, allowing hominins to migrate on foot across what is now open sea. Archaeological finds support this scenario. Musterian tools have been found in Sicily, Malta, and southern Italy, suggesting repeated occupation or transit through the central Mediterranean. 
This route would have been especially viable for populations using Levallois technology, which enabled adaptation to diverse environments. If the Jebel Irhud population moved northward, or if related groups moved south, Malta and Sicily would have served as way stations, places of temporary occupation or cultural transmission. These migrations would have created zones of genetic and cultural exchange, allowing the Musterian tradition and the biological legacy of early Homo sapiens to penetrate into Europe well before the famous Out of Africa wave around 60,000 years ago. The facial features of Jebel Irhud 10 and the lesser-known Arago fragments do not match perfectly, nor should they. These were regional populations shaped by different environments and timelines, but the similarities suggest something deeper than convergence, an ancient kinship forged before full speciation. Modern human evolution was never linear. It was a braided stream with tributaries diverging and rejoining. The Jebel Irhud fossils, far from being isolated in North Africa, appear to sit at the base of this braided stream, where multiple populations of archaic Homo exchanged genes and ideas. The Arago fossils, then, may not be a dead-end Neanderthal precursor, but a sibling lineage, possibly even a hybrid population, absorbing waves of southern migrants as the climate permitted. The centrality of Irhud 10, a probable female, in this theory challenges long-standing biases in how we narrate prehistory. While robust male skulls dominate textbooks and museum displays, it may be the gracile female faces that hold the secrets to our past. They are more conserved, more comparable and less distorted by size-related exaggeration. Female individuals may also have played a crucial role in migration and social exchange. In many small-scale societies, females move between groups, bringing with them new genes, customs and alliances. If this held true for early Homo sapiens, it would have been women like Irhud Ten who spread Musterian culture, language and shared ancestry into Europe. The link between Jebel Irhud and Arago is not a single piece of evidence, but a convergence of clues. Shared Musterian tools, similar facial morphologies, the presence of both robust males and gracile females, and geological corridors exposed by Ice Age seas. Irhud 10, with her remarkably modern face, may represent a snapshot of an ancient Mediterranean diaspora, a lineage that flowed northward through land now lost beneath the sea, leaving behind fragments in caves and flint beneath the soil. If Arago 7 and Irhud 10 share even a shadow of ancestry, then the story of modern humans is far older, far more interconnected, and far more mobile than we once believed. The discovery of a Neanderthal tooth marks a significant southward expansion of this population's range, which is associated with diverse technological practices, as evidenced by the presence of the Nubian Levallois reduction method, among other Levallois techniques. Anthropologist Chris Stringer, a human evolution expert at the British Museum, wrote that, We've long wondered if Neanderthals ever made their way to Africa. A Neanderthal tooth was found less than 200 miles from Africa, so this discovery strengthens the possibility that they did make it there. Secondly, he says, the stone tools discovered there were thought to be the work of modern humans. As of now, no direct evidence of Neanderthals have been found in Africa, but this assumption may now have to change. According to a statement issued by the Max Planck Institute of Geoanthropology, an international team of scientists has conducted a new analysis of a tooth and stone tools discovered in Shukba Cave, located in the Judean Mountains. The researchers discovered a molar from a Neanderthal child aged about nine, making the cave the southernmost known Neanderthal site. Furthermore, stone tools classified as Nubian Levallois type have been linked to the Neanderthal tooth. What's more, these findings lend support to long-held theories about Neanderthal occupations at sites even further south, such as Tor Faraj and Tor Sabiha, near the Red Sea only 100 miles from Africa. This finding challenges the traditional view of Neanderthals as confined to Europe and Western Asia, indicating climate-driven migration could have pushed them south, though arid conditions posed barriers. Indeed, the idea that the Red Sea was a formidable barrier for movement into and out of Africa for our species is a very strange idea, 
especially because during the colder climate of the past, lower sea levels meant it was little more than an inland salt lake most of the time. The Levant was inhabited by three hominin groups, archaic Neanderthal-like Homo, Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens. The evidence suggests that some of these hominins coexisted. Indeed, as previously noted, Neanderthal traits occur among early Homo sapiens, while modern human traits can be found among the alleged Near Eastern Neanderthals. These fossils were briefly classified as Paleoanthropus palestinensis to bridge the gap between the modern humans and the Neanderthalians of Western Europe. Within the sample, the Neanderthal morphological traits never occur combined in one individual, as has been found in the European Neanderthals. Thus the sample is lacking the total morphological pattern that would affiliate it with the classic European Neanderthals. But many fossils from North Africa have Neanderthal features, including from Jebel Irhud, and less known sites such as Gardalam in Malta, Hawa Ftea in Libya, and Rabat and Tangier in Morocco. Excavations in the cave of Gardalam, in the southeastern corner of Malta, brought to light the remains of Neanderthal man in that island, thus extending the distribution of this species to another continent, for in a zoological sense, Malta is African rather than European. It is true that so far only two teeth have been found in Malta, a first upper molar and a milk molar, but those who are familiar with the characteristic form of the molar teeth of Neanderthal man will have no hesitation in assenting to the truth of this discovery. Now, experts from the London Natural History Museum have revived the theory that the tooth could prove Neanderthals once roamed the island. The British anthropologist proposed the theory in the 1920s, but it lost credibility four decades later, when Neanderthals were dismissed as simple-minded brutes by the out-of-Africa theorists. International experts have recently identified exclusively Neanderthal features in at least one molar discovered during the 1917 dig in Gar Dalam. Neanderthals are our closest extinct human relatives, dating back 300,000 years. They have a distinct receding forehead and prominent brow. Researchers discovered features on the surfaces of the molars by inspecting their grooves and edges, including a specific cusp that formed a type of dental fingerprint. The experts say this is undeniably Neanderthal. Certain aspects of the teeth found at Hawaftea in Libya also fall into the same category. It may at the same time be noted that the much-worn left upper second molar from the caves of Hercules on the Atlantic coast in the international zone of Tangier, which is also attributed to a Neanderthaloid form, was probably torodont only to a sub-moderate degree. While conclusions drawn from so incomplete a specimen can only be tentative, the indications certainly suggest that the Hawaftea find may be most closely linked with the Taban group of the Mount Carmel Neanderthaloids. The South Levantine Mid-Middle Paleolithic is remarkable for its exceptional evidence of human morphological variability with contemporaneous fossils of Homo sapiens and Neanderthal-like hominins. In fact, a new study has just suggested that a fossil known as School One, a child who lived 140,000 years ago near Mount Carmel in the eastern Mediterranean, was a Neanderthal sapiens hybrid based on its unique combination of features. The Mediterranean may divide today, but in the Pleistocene it connected, and in its forgotten crossings we may find the roots of who we are. And with that statement, we leave you to ponder the mysteries of our shared human history. Until next time, stay curious and stay questioning, within peer-reviewed limits, of course. Also, please subscribe, share, and explore our channel's other highly compelling videos. Thank you and take care.